Hello friends, how are you doing and I hope you really all are having a great and fun time and everything is going smooth and awesome, right? We are, we will be discussing the, the question and answer of the excretory products elimination of the CBSC pattern, right? Let us start with the first question, what is the basic nitrogenous catabolic product of metabolism, right? What is a basic nitrogenous catabolic product of metabolism? The basic nitrogenous catabolic product of metabolism will be always ammonia. The basic nitrogenous catabolic product of metabolism will be always ammonia, right? Now since ammonia is highly soluble in water, since ammonia is highly soluble in water, what we will see that ammonia sometimes gets converted into urea and these will be ureotelic animals. Ammonia sometimes get converted into uric acid, uric acid and these will be called as the uricotelic animals. For example, the reptiles, the birds, right, the insects and all that, these are uricotelic. Why ammonia is highly soluble in water? So, will require a lot of water for its excretion, right? The basic nitrogenous catabolic product of metabolism will be always ammonia, absolutely. We go on to the next question, what are the parts of the renal corpuscle or the Malpighian corpuscle, absolutely wonderful. The parts of the renal corpuscle will be, the parts of the renal corpuscle will be first of all there will be the Bowman's capsule, the Bowman's capsule and the other one will be the glomerulus and these two together will be forming what? Will be together forming the renal corpuscle right, these two together will form the renal corpuscle. So, what do we see? Right, there will be the afferent arteriole and you know what we will see, yes. And this will be the efferent arteriole. Is not it? The efferent arteriole and the afferent arteriole. So, this is combining of the glomerulus, this is combining, this is the Bowman's capsule and the whole thing together, the whole thing together will comprise of what we call as the, the renal corpuscle or the Malpighian corpuscle, right? The next, In which animal the Malpighian tubules act as the excretory organ? The, the Malpighian, the Malpighian, okay, tubules act as excretory organ 
act as excretory organ in cockroach and the grasshopper right cockroach and the grasshopper so the malpighian tubules act as, act as a excretory organ in the cockroach and the grasshopper right we move on to the next question what is ureotelism i have already explained you what is ureotelism right <coughs> the animals which excrete in the form of urea are the ureotelic animals and this process is called as ureotelism the animals which excrete in the form of urea in the form of urea are ureotelic animals are ureo telic animals and the process and the process is called as ureotelism is called as ureotelism okay the animals which excrete in the form of urea are what these are the ureotelic animals and the process is called as ureotelism okay example are what the amphibians the mammals and all the amphibians the mammals so what is happening basically you know ammonia is getting converted to urea and why ammonia is getting converted to urea we'll see you know ammonia is highly soluble in water and hence you know for this removal of ammonia a lot of water will be required so highly soluble in water highly soluble in water so for its removal so its removal will require lot amount of water lot amount of water however urea urea this is less soluble in water this is less soluble in water right less toxic less toxic and hence an adaptation an adaptation for land animals for land animals and that is why the land animals you know adhered to or changed to you know the ureotelism right we move on to the next session sorry the next question how does the liver serve both as a digestive as and even as an excretory organ beautiful the liver is the largest exocrine gland right liver is the largest exocrine gland okay now what we said that you know it serves both as a digestive as well as the excretory organ so when we are talking about the digestive function of the liver digestive function and the next one is the excretory function
right excretory function. So, when we are talking about the digestive function we will see that the liver secretes by liver secretes bile juice right we have seen that you know the liver consists of hepatocytes and in the bile canaliculi these hepatocytes will secrete the bile and from there to the herring duct to the herring duct the bile duct and from each of the bile duct what happens it comes the right hepatic duct right the left hepatic duct and the common hepatic duct and the bile duct ok the common and the hepatopancreatic duct it reaches the duodenum finally. So, the liver secretes the bile juice the liver secretes the bile juice which helps in the emulsification of fat ok the bile salts present here helps in the emulsification of fats emulsification of fat and what are the bile salts present the sodium glucocolate and the sodium taurocolate right emulsification of fat emulsification is breaking down ok emulsification is breaking down of larger fat molecules into smaller fat molecules So, emulsification is breaking down of the larger fat molecules into the smaller fat molecules. Now, when we talk about the excretory function see liver is the principal organ of excretion after kidney we can say. So, what is liver doing liver is basically converting ok is forming urea is forming urea by ornithine ornithine. Okay, or nithin cycle or the Krebs Hanslet cycle or the urea cycle or the urea cycle. Okay. So, the liver urea is formed here what happens over here there is deamination okay, of amino group in the liver and urea gets formed. Also you know what happens you know in the see what is happening the bile juice is also containing is also containing some of the pigments like the bilirubin biliverdin which is removed in the urine and also you know here we have some amount of cholesterol which will ultimately from the bile juice the cholesterol and certain drugs ok cholesterol and also cholesterol and certain drugs are also removed by the liver removed by liver. So, hence it also plays a very important role in the excretory function. Okay. Now, we move on to the next question is the ultrafiltration process in the glomerulus a passive or an active process ultra filtration ok ultra filtration in glomerulus right is a passive process ok is a passive process it does not require energy is a passive process not requiring energy not requiring energy not requiring energy this is due to the difference in pressure ok this is due to the difference in pressure and you know the ultra filtration is also mainly contributed by the difference in the lumen 
of the afferent and the afferent arteriole, right. So, this is also contributed, this is also contributed, contributed by the difference in lumen by the difference in lumen of the afferent of the afferent and efferent arteriole and efferent arteriole right. This is also contributed by the difference in the lumen of the afferent and the efferent arteriole. So, hence ultrafiltration in the glomerulus is a passive process. We move on to the next question, right. The chances of kidney failure are more in those who have the high pressure, right, why? Now, as I told you, right, these are the glomerular capillaries, this is the afferent arteriole and this is the afferent arteriole, right. The blood is flowing from here and then it goes all the way through and it comes out through the efferent arteriole that is the exit arteriole, this is the Bowman's capsule and the glomerular capillaries together call as the Malpighian capsule or the Malpighian corpuscle. Now, if there is high pressure, those of high pressure, high pressure means high pressure of blood. So, what is happening you know, the blood will come at a very high pressure and enter this arteriole, enter at a very high pressure. Now, when it is passing through these glomerular capillaries, what happens you know, what happens because of this high pressure, these capillaries tend to you know disrupt and hence there will be a kidney failure. Thus, because of high pressure, of high pressure, the pressure of the blood entering the, the pressure. of blood entering the afferent arteriole would be high, the afferent arteriole, arteriole would be high, would be high, right. This is because of high pressure the pressure of blood entering the afferent arteriole would be high and hence and hence the right and hence the chances of disruption and hence the chances of disruption of the capillaries would be high would be high, okay. We move on to the next question. Why is reabsorption described? as a selective process. Now, reabsorption, reabsorption is the absorption, is the absorption of certain products of certain products 
or certain substances rather of certain substances okay like glucose and all like glucose and all in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct in the distal convoluted convoluted tubule and the collecting duct and the collecting duct okay reabsorption of the is the absorption of certain substances like glucose and all in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct so what is happening you know this what do you mean by selective it is selecting substances not all substances you know going through the filtrate is reabsorbed if urea is passing it will allow urea to pass if creatinine is passing it will allow creatinine to pass but when sodium when glucose when other important substances are passing and that is why you know it reabsorbs them back into the into the what into the medullary region or the medullary interstitium whatever from the filtrate and that is why we say that it is a selective process hence as only selected selective okay hence as only selective substances are reabsorbed thus called as a selective process called as selective process okay we move on to the next question describe the role of adh and counter current system in the formation of the hypertonic urine now what is adh quickly see you'll see adh is nothing but the anti diuretic hormone which is also called as the vasopressin which is released from the posterior lobe of pituitary okay released from the posterior lobe of pituitary posterior lobe of pituitary right the adh is the anti diuretic hormone of the vasopressin released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary and what does it do it reabsorbs water from the from the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct this reabsorbs water right from the distal convoluted tubule dct that is and the collecting duct and collecting duct right this reabsorbs water from the dct and the collecting duct so this is the role of adh and counter current system and then we were we will be talking about the counter current system the counter current system is formed by the loop of henle and the peritubular capillaries and the vasa recta formed by okay formed by the loop of henle loop of henle and peritubular capillaries and vasa recta right the counter current mechanism helps in the absorption of sodium and other electrolytes right this helps in in fact absorption of actually water this helps in the absorption of water from the filtrate 
So, you know a, when it is actually absorbing sodium and the electrolytes even the water is getting you know is coming out of it. So, this helps in the absorption of water from the filtrate thus concentrating the urine thus concentrating thus concentrating the urine. So, both is concentrating the urine and hence producing a hypertonic urine ADH is also absorbing reabsorbing water and even the counter current mechanism is reabsorbing water from the urine right. So, now we will move on to the next question. Now, we will move on to the next question and so, what is the next question we will see? What are the normal and abnormal constituents of urine? When we talk of the normal constituents of urine, what we will see that you know it has both the organic and the inorganic part and in inorganic you know there will be the sodium, the chlorine to very minor extent and all that ok. This basically has urea ok, creatin, creatin, creatinine, creatinine, hepuric acid and all that, hepuric acid ok. When we talk of the abnormal constituents, abnormal constituents then you know if you see the glucose right, glucose and other constituents and other constituents ok and anything you know above the normal constituent would be abnormal in the urine. So, friends finally, we have come to the end of this discussion. I hope you have followed this. Any doubts you can always come back to me the time we meet again a very good bye from this side. Thank you.